Aren't you glad God gave us Jesus? Amen. Well, let us join in prayer and worship and thankfulness. Join with me. So, oh, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for giving us Jesus. Yes. For giving us someone who sacrificed himself to give us peace and joy and continues to give us love <clears throat> in happiness and in sadness. He leads us through, will, uh, through the wilderness and makes us happy in fields of flowers. And we thank you so much for that blessing. And we, we just ask that you allow the, the love and peace Jesus gives us to sustain us through many dangers, toils, and snares life gives us. Whether they be man-made dangers, toils, and snares, or otherwise, we know that you will keep us protected and love as you have. And we ask that you keep your hands upon those dealing with physical challenges, both in this community and out, but we especially lift up Dolores Tolson, Sarah Griffin, Vivian Adams, Dr. Lawrence Dunmore Sr., Ronald Ellison, Deacon Sterling, Rhett Lucas, Deacon John Ross, Grace Ridgely, Deacon John Brown, Barbara Kelly, Bethany Butler, Marcellus Williams, Curtis Hannigan, Odell Muzin, Juanita Boyd, Tara Smith, and Lejeune Smith, Deacon Be Beatrice Kelly, and the family of Deacon Emeritus, Dorothy Lo Loins. We ask that you lift these people, these loved ones in our community and their families and give them peace and strength. But we also ask you to remind us, even as we ask for peace and strength through challenges, to remember that life is full of happiness and love because of you. So fill our hearts with that love and remind us every day that God is love and Jesus is love. Amen. Amen. Now let us join together in a moment of praise.
You good? Good morning, Reverend Hagler. Good morning. Reverend Boyd Clark. Reverend Brown. Good morning. Minister Wilson. Senior choir. Musicians, officers, members, and friends. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ina Slaughter, and I'm a member of the Greeters Ministry. It is my pleasure to recognize all guests who are worshiping with us today. We do not have any registered guests, so if you are visiting with us today, will you please stand? Well, I know we do. Oh, oh, oh. And I know we have some returning visitors with us today, so welcome to you as well. On behalf of our pastor, Reverend Hagler, the ministerial team, and members of Plymouth, we welcome you to our service. Amen. We hope and trust that the spoken word, the sincere prayers, the sacred music, and the warm fellowship of our members will touch you in such a way that you will come back and worship with us again. In closing, I would like to share some thoughts with you about love as we are about to head into Valentine's Day this week. This is called Somebody Loves You. Somebody loves you more than you know. Somebody goes with you wherever you go. Somebody really and truly cares and lovingly listens to all of your prayers. Don't doubt for a minute that this is not true. For God loves his children and takes care of them too. And all of his treasures are yours to share. If you love him completely and you show and show that you care. And if you walk in his footsteps and have faith to believe, there's nothing you ask for that you will not receive. Again, welcome. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. One of the songs that is sung during the invocation portion of the service is welcome into this place. It goes welcome into this place, welcome into this holy vessel. You desire to abide in the praises of your people so we lift our hands and we lift our hearts as we offer up these praises to your name. So again, as Sister Slaughter has welcomed us, we welcome you again. And may God's peace dwell in you through Christ Jesus as a welcome church. I ask that you get up and pass this peace mm -hmm. among us. So may the peace of God be with you. Also with you. Amen. Let's welcome one another.
Thank you, Bill. And as we gather here, we particularly rejoice today. I would like to invite Paul uh, uh, to receive the right hand of fellowship, uh, Sister Crystal Lewis. Sister Crystal, you come forward. Amen. Amen. And I guess he's being a coming back from the prayer park. Is that right? And uh, for those of you, come stand, stand here for Sarah. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Sister Crystal has her Master's of Sacred Theology uh, and from Wesley, right? From Wesley uh, Seminary. And so we are really rejoicing in her presence uh, with us uh, in this day. If you would turn around and place a flag for the hip symbol, turn around, please. And uh, I invite you to join, you can read along on uh, page 34 of the United Church of Christ. And we hear the words of our Lord that says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. And everyone who acknowledges me before human beings, I will also acknowledge before my Creator who is in heaven. Jesus has joined you, has chosen you, and in baptism has joined you to himself. He's called you together with us and through the church, which is his body. He has brought you to this time and place to unite with us in the ministries and the blessings of this congregation. As you come into our midst, uh, Crystal, we invite you to reaffirm your faith as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Do you reaffirm your faith in God as your creator, in Christ as your Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your strength? Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this congregation as it serves the community and the world? I do. I also have some additional prayers. Do you promise to be engaged in a study of your scriptures and seek out the Holy Spirit where it may lead and guide you? I do. Amen. Then let us, the members of Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ, rise and express our mutual ministry together. Join with me in unison in the bold face print on page 35. And it says, We welcome you with joy and abundance in the common life of this church. We promise to our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and dreams of the church of Jesus Christ. God grant that together we may continue to grow in the knowledge and love and be witnesses of our risen Lord. Let us draw in a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this moment together. We thank you for Sister Crystal coming forth and presenting herself. We thank you for Plymouth Church being able to surround her with our love and prayers and thoughts and that she comes to share her gifts and talents with us. And Lord, we just ask for your fresh anointing that you lift us up and you empower us to live out your word in some bold new ways. And all these things we pray today in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Congregation, you may be seated. As Congress is seated. On behalf of the Congregation of the United Church of Christ, I extend you the right hand of fellowship and a warm love to welcome you to the Congregation of the United Church of Christ. Step back here, face the congregation, and from deacons will want to come and greet you as well. <laughs> Um, to remind us that on uh, next Sunday, February the 9th, 
19th. Uh, there are two events I draw your attention to. Uh, one is the uh, uh, seminar and lunch after the 11 a.m. service on Healthy Heart. Uh, to join us in the underground uh, downstairs. Uh, and so mark that on your calendar right after the 11 o'clock service. And then at 4, we will have the talent musician. <laughs> Which will be uh, at four o'clock, uh, and that will be a truly blessed time. Come and mark that or on your calendar; you will not be uh, disappointed. On February the 26th is African Heritage uh, Potluck Service, uh, uh, supper after service at the 11 o'clock service. Uh, so we ask that you mark and that. And one of the requests there is that for me uh, to invite folks to wear their African dress, their African dress to church service, uh, and that uh, we may just gather together in unity, lifting up our African heritage together. And uh, so come and be a part of that. One reminder also of uh, Bible study on Thursdays at noon and midweek service on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, you will be blessed in, uh, uh, in those times together. Also, I want to invite you to draw your attention to, um, there has been invitation for a little prayer over. Make your announcement. We are inviting you, some of you received emails from me, some of you got an urgent, please write a prayer for the uh, booklet. So I'm extending that urgent call again. If you would please, if you if you if you handwrite it, I will take it. And we will get it uh, typed and into our system. So please, the prayers are effectively due today. But if you could get it to me no later than tomorrow, please guys, tomorrow, because I've got um, a production schedule that Monique and I are trying to meet. So, and our theme is uh, spiritual fasting and fitness from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, I believe, verses 1 through 6. So please let God inspire you to write a prayer. It doesn't have to be long. Uh, it could be an affirmation. But we, we do want a good representation from our congregation in celebration of our next season. Amen? Amen. Amen. And also, as a reminder, coming up on Wednesday, March 1st, is Ash Wednesday, and we always have our Unity Ash Wednesday service at Lincoln Congregational Temple. Uh, and then the next night, which is the 2nd of March, we begin our Lenten study worship series. And we have some very dynamic and diverse uh, preachers and teachers that are coming uh, to share with us on, on those evenings. So the all doing Lent, six weeks of Lent service on Thursday night, uh, beginning on March 2nd. So we draw that to your attention as well. Uh, Wendy, you're going to make an announcement as well, right? Good morning, Reverend Hagler. Good morning. Reverend Carolyn Boyd. Mm -hmm. Good morning, uh, Minister Jason Carson Wilson, Reverend Brown, flyers, musicians, members, and friends of Plymouth Congregation United Church of Christ. On behalf of our chair of the trustee board, Bonita Taylor, who is under the weather today, I'd like to make this announcement. My name is Wendy Brown, I'm on the trustee board. So, my Plymouth family, the 2016 end of year letters are ready. They will be distributed before and after service um, on the eight o'clock and today the 11 o'clock and next Sunday the 19th as well. You can pick up your statement. Um, if you're not able to um, pick up your statement after service, we will certainly be able to mail that out to you as well. Um, I also wanna draw your attention to a message from Bonita that's in our bulletin. I'll take a moment to read over um, a message from our chair of the trustee board and also our stewardship chair, uh, Wilma Teen Slaughter. And that's towards the back of your bulletin. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And as is our custom on communion Sunday week, take up the second offering in addition to our tithes. The second offering goes to the benevolence fund of the church and that's a fund that is maintained so that those who are going through difficult situations uh, uh, can, um, uh, can be helped. Uh, so it's another way in which we engage uh, in the ministry. So please be generous with the benevolence offering. It's now the time that we bring our tithes into God's house. We remind ourselves that the tithe is 10%. 10%. And, and, and why is that number up there? Well, it's, a, it's just the idea of a number, a portion of that which God has blessed.
bless us. Because it reminds us that all that we have belongs to the Lord anyway. There is nothing that uh, we have that is our own. I know we like to think of it that way, but it's, it's been provided. And we're called to be stewards, which means we manage the gifts that God has given to us for convenience and for warmth and for all of those things that are necessary to live. But we also manage it in such a way that we pass on a portion of that for the blessings of the work of the church. Uh, please be generous, please be faithful with your contributions, your tithes, and your gifts. I'm going to invite the trustees to come forth and receive those tithes and gifts that we follow by the diagonal that will lift up the benevolence offering. The first fruits of them that sleep. That little tidbit, musical tidbit from the Messiah, I know that my Redeemer liveth, speaks to the first fruits. It's here in this situation, it's talking about Jesus being the first individual who died but yet raised up. So he's the first fruit. And that concept of first fruit is given throughout various traditions in Hebrew tradition, Roman tradition, the Greek tradition, and also in our own African American tradition when we see the Kwanzaa ceremony, <clears throat> when we bring the first fruits in to our houses to eat. In the Hebrew tradition, the first fruits were brought in from the fields and given to the, the elites, the priests, so they would have something to eat. So they bring all your first fruits or your tithes into the storehouse, as Malachi says. Why? So that there may be meat in my house, so that we may praise the Lord. So with regards to that tradition of first fruits, God has made provision for us, as our pastor has said a few seconds ago, that we take this provision to give back to God for the ministry of the way. So Father, we thank you for the provision, and we give them forth to you now, so that we can be about the work of ministry here in this house in Plymouth. Amen. Amen.
Any youth here? Come forward. Okay. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we thank you that King Jesus is a listener, Amen. and will hear this young man's prayer. Amen. Yes, will. And so we just uh, we know that you'll be hearing his prayers, but we raise up prayers for him. We raise up prayers for him and all children like him. Amen. And children older than him, yes. that you keep them under your loving arms, yes. and have those loving arms wrapped around him and all the children of the world, because we know that Jesus loves the little children and the big children too, Amen. Amen. and keeps them safe. And also protects them in times of trouble and reminds them that they are special yes. even when others make make them forget so we just ask today that you bless this young man and all the little children and keep him and bless him today and bless him in the future Amen. invited to read our, our scripture lesson on in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 to 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 to 20. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find it on page 180 in the Pew Bible. And it reads this way, it says, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees, 
and ordinances. Then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. May God add a blessing to the reading of those words. Let us join in prayer together. Lord, we come to you today and we give thanks for this word that is opened to us and for us and give us the ability now to not only read these words but to perceive what they are saying to us in these moments in which we stand, these days and hours in which we live. For one thing is always certain, Lord, and that is that you are the potter and we are the clay. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are perfectly fitted for your kingdom and able to call ourselves disciples of Jesus the Christ. Now as we come to this teaching time, you hone it, you shape it, you develop it, you send it forth as you see fit. Allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. 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 Why don't we give God some praise this morning? Just because God is praiseworthy. Amen. To remind ourselves that we do not really enter into worship until that moment that we really give God some praise. Because it's so easy in life for us to go through life and through, through a day and through a schedule and don't even pay attention to the way in which God has provided and God has opened doors for us and God has made a way for us. We just go on through the day and sometimes we even think that we did it all on our own. But in order to truly get into that spirit of worship, we got to recognize God for who God is, that he has been our help, our guide, and our light all of our days. And so that's why we give the Lord some praise. Will you praise him one more time with me? Amen. Amen. I want to speak on the subject of life choices. Life choices. We all know that we have choices in life. We have choices. And some of us take our choices and we make bad choices. And at times folk make good choices. But there's choices in life. And we realize that some have more choices than others. Some are able to live life with a plethora of choices and some have only what is placed before them and it's very limited. There are some people whose choices are limited by station and finances in life. Some people come into life with severely limited choices and without a radical change occurring in circumstances, the conclusion of life are already defined for some. You got people that are looking at behavior patterns in grade school and building prisons for those folks 18 years down the road. You have private prison agencies that are actually looking at the schools to design what, can, what is going to be the supply and the demand later on. And that are folks that they look at and declare that some people have limited choices. Limited choices. Some people think that a little bitty street corner is their life. Not a whole world, but a little tiny street corner that they defend with their lives. 
and they take people out because of that little tiny street corner. And you know, and, and I realize that what you have in that case, you have people that don't understand that there's a world that's larger than that street corner. And if that, your world is not larger than that street corner, how do you make informed decisions? And how do you make choices? If you don't even know that choices are there to be made, how, how do you make choices that affect your life in a positive and quality way? Some people's world has shrunk extremely small, that it is just this place in which they live and the circumstances that happen to them day in and day out, and they do not know that there's a world that is larger out there. Just think of it. How do you make choices when you don't even know that there's choices to be made? How do you make a choice about education unless somehow you have seen the impact that education can have on a life. In other words, you don't know that education can really affect your life unless you have had the experience of that, unless you're able to reach into that reservoir of experience and know what the impact of education can look like, can feel like. I remember growing up all my life, I heard from my father uh, that I was going to college. He had made the choice for me. Right? It wasn't about my choice any longer. But that came out of, Brother McDaniel, his denial of being able to get a college education himself. He worked at the post office. And at the post office over in Baltimore, he was trying to go to Morgan State College at night to get a degree in time and work at the post office to support the family. And, 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 the, one, and the manager of that station called all of the black uh, postal workers in and said, you have a choice. You either go to school or you work here, but you're not going to do both. And so he had to make the decision of supporting his family. And so if you can imagine, that choice of a higher education became even more of a burning passion in his spirit because he had been denied, and he was going to not allow anyone to deny anyone else around him. That was a choice that he made. And see, sometimes we recognize that our choices are limited. They're limited by circumstance. They're limited by life. They're limited by race. They're limited by all of those kind of biases that we are impacted with. And, and the fact is, is that what we got to do, we got to recognize that there are those in our world who have limited choices, and there are others who have a plethora of choices that they can, for example, go on a vacation. There are folk who got a job that even pays a decent wage and they actually get some time off. There are folks who uh, can take for granted the fact that they got a decent roof over their head, that they have choices in life. And on the other hand, there are folks who are denied some of the basic values that a society should be offering them. There are folks who are denied a decent education, folks who are denied the ability to move up a ladder because they've been denied things all along in the pathway. Their choices are limited. Some people languish. For example, in poverty, and because of that poverty, are surrounded by limiting conditions all around them. And on the other hand, there are people who are born at the right time, into the right places, and into the right community that have choices, freedom, and the ability to dream and actualize those dreams. Some have choices, and some have less choices. When I think of this issue around choices, I, I, I realize this thing that we sometimes overlook, but we can't overlook it as a community because we have some 2.3 million prisoners in the United States today, according to the 2010 census. But listen to me. Our national incarceration rate stands at 700 and seven per 100,000 residents. This makes it the highest incarceration rate in the world. We incarcerate more people in the United States than most of the countries that we claim as terrorist states or human rights violators. We exceed those countries by a wide margin. But we jail people for reasons that are 
bias by race and economics. The racial disparities are amazing in regards to who goes to jail and who does not. Blacks and Latinos are often denied due process because of the economic need to rely on public defenders when in trouble with the law. And most of the public defender agencies will attest to the fact that they're underfunded and that they're understaffed to do an effective enough job. So in large part, we can say that these prisons that exist in the United States are pauper prisons, receiving the poor and those of less resources and those with fewer choices. Michelle Alexander, in her stirring book, The New Jim Crow, highlights how jails have been filled up under the guise of a war on drugs, a war on drugs. But now all of a sudden we're finding out that opiate addiction is a medical problem and not a criminal problem when it has now affected the white community. Right? So somehow the whole perspective around drugs has shifted just because of who's impacted by it. Right? And so the politicians have used it and sustained this idea of a war on drugs and enlarged it in order to get bigger, buzzet, get bigger uh, uh, budgets and also to build bigger jails. And those in power created mechanisms to absorb those without choices those who were hopeless, those who were defeated before adult life really began, and that is the prison industrial complex. And some operated privately where inmates are truly seen as commodities. According to a Washington Post article, we have slightly more jails and prisons in the United States, 5,000 plus, than we do degree-granting colleges and universities. So we got more jails than schools. In many parts of America, particularly the South, there are more people living in prison than on college campuses. Choices are not there for some, and those with choices must choose to be advocates for those without choices. I've often said that the blessed of us must help the rest of us until the rest of us become the blessed of us. It is about having choices in life. It is about making choices. It's about having enough information also to know the choices that we are making. When we make choices without the proper information or analysis, it is a risk and a chance that you are taking that often leads up to challenging results. Just ask yourself about the choice that folks made in November. Had little or no information. And now I see some of the folks turn around and say, well, I didn't think he would do it. Fool, he told you he was going to do it. You know, I, 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 I've, I've learned somewhere along the way that you listen to folk and you take them at their word. And if they don't mean it, then something's wrong with them. There's a schizophrenia in them and they need to go see a doctor. Right. But he told you up front. So don't be surprised right now. But we make choices on misinformation. We make choices on things that we believe or want to believe. We make choices because we want to excuse certain things, not examine it, not understand what is going on, and we end up sometimes making bad choices. Brothers and sisters, we can see what's going on in this country today. We can see that one group of people are being pitted against another group of people, quite intentionally by a third group of people. We can see that forces hostile to choices are in control of this nation for a while. And all of us under attack, we must look at the situation and make our choice to band together, to stand up for and with each other, inclusive of immigrants, documented and undocumented. This is the choice we must make for living, for surviving, and for overcoming. This is the choice that we must make. You see, the devil can make choices for you, but God, thank God, is still in charge. And for those of us who are people who fear God, we're called to make choices with God and in God's spirit. Those in power are making destructive choices over us. And we must make choices that are positive, that are sustaining, that are life-giving, that's empowering and reflective of our liberation faith values. There are choices, and the choice here today is one of destruction or one of life. Now, this is what this text in Deuteronomy is saying. Read it, understand it, that we have choices. We have free will. And 
Each choice we proceed with has its own consequences and its own ramifications. As this text in Deuteronomy states, the results of our choices will be either life and prosperity or death and adversity. There are choices of life and choices in life. We make choices all the time. There are individual choices and there are collective choices. Now, the text here is reminding us as if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I'm commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. Now, now some people have become obsessed with trying to discover the right commandment, the right way, the right decree, and the right ordinances that they become harmful towards others over their obsession. And so rather than causing life and prosperity, they bring on death and adversity to everyone else and eventually themselves. I see folks when I was in Palestine, Israel, Jewish settlers who, who, who think that they are zealously following the Lord's command and treating everybody who is not Jewish so disrespected, so angrily, and, and, and pushing and kicking at people and treating them as if they're garbage. That is nothing that's reflective of God. You see, God is a God of justice. And God is a God that loves all humanity without exception. I, I, I saw a settler coming out of a synagogue with an assault weapon on his shoulder. Out of worship with an assault weapon. Think of that. Surrounded by a platoon of Israeli troops who are protecting the armed settler coming out of synagogue. And they're kicking children out of the way who are trying to sell little trinkets so they can feed their family. They're kicking little children. That does not reflect God. That does not reflect God's hope. That does not reflect God's hope. But they made a choice. But I want to remind folks because folks always get caught up and say, well, it's their land. It says so right in the scripture that it's their land. Well, I got news for you. They got kicked off the land. History and powers in the world removed folks from the world, dispersed them around the world. Israel has only been there in modern times since 1948. It was just after World War II. And folks have come in from Europe and imposed their will on other folks, not reflecting the will of God, making choices for people that were not godly choices, but they were choices that brought harm and hurt and hatred. Sisters and brothers, that's a part of what God is warning folks. He says, if you don't follow my way, and what does it mean to follow God's way? Well, we get a hint of what it means to follow God's way when we look, for example, at Luke chapter 10, verse 27, where Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God. The scriptures say that, and Jesus repeats. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Amen. The declaration here is that it's not really a thing of ordinance and decree, but a choice to open one's heart to receive God, to receive others, and to receive the beauty of life. The text goes on to, to warn us. It says, but if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Yeah. In other words, there's a mission to hold on to a loving relationship with God. Yeah. But how can, as the John says, how can I claim to love God whom I haven't seen? and hate my neighbor, who I have seen, right? He, he, he reminds us that that is a contradictory and ungodly thing. You know, it's, it's, it's about the choices that we make in life. Are you, are you willing to walk along with God? Most people make choices out of fear. Most folks say, well, I can't do that because, uh, and I have to go down that road and something might happen to me. You know, we make choices. And sometimes when we don't make choices, we got to remember we're making a choice then too. 
You know, it's just like when folks say, well, I don't like either one of the candidates, so I'm not going to vote. I got news for you. You voted. You may not have gone to the polls, but you voted because your lack of a vote was a vote for the one who won. Right? So the fact is that every time that we think we're abdicating, making a choice, abdicating for that, we're making a choice. We are making a choice. So here in this place, he's saying, this is the choice that you ought to make. If you want to stay on the land, you got to treat people with respect. You want to stay on the land, you got to walk like God. You want to stay on the land and, 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 and receive this inheritance, well, you need to treat your neighbor as you want to treat yourself. And as the lawyer came along, he said, well, Lord, what is the most important commandment? And, and, and Jesus had to break it back down to him and said, you, but don't you know what it is? Love the glory of your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He said, it all hinges right there. And so it's when we put out hatred in this country, that's what we're going to get back. When we put out dishonesty in this country, that's what we're going to get back. When we put out the uh, uh, murder and killing, that's what we're going to get back. And see, the issue here is the God that we worship all the time in the United States of America, and we've got to get that out of our system. The God we worship is a God of greed, is a God of selfishness, is a God of self-centeredness. It's a God of me, myself, and I. That's the God that we bow down to every day. But I'm telling you right now, you got to get up and open your heart to a God who's a God of love, a God who's a God of welcoming, a God who is a God of justice, a God who is a God of hope, a light unto the nations, a light unto our pathways. we got to respond to a God of love. Walter Brueggemann. One of my favorite theologians, Crystal. She knows a little bit about all this. She, she reads all that stuff. A amen. But, but, but his, his, his argument was, as he reads through the scripture, and he points at Israel, he says, Israel's ability to survive is its ability to remember. And once it ceased to remember, it ceased to exist. Right? Those ideas about... Do you remember who led you through the desert these 40 years? Who, who, who fed you with manna from heaven? Who quenched your thirst with flinty rock? Your clothes didn't even wear out? Your feet didn't even swell up? Do you remember who the one that did that? And do you remember that you were once a stranger in a strange land? And therefore, that's why you're supposed to be kind to the sojourner, the stranger, and the alien. Do you remember that it was God who acted out in miraculous ways in order to deliver you from bondage anyway? Do you remember it was the Lord who gave to you the prayer that is in your heart and the determination with which to live life in, 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 in a more hopeful way? Do you remember it was God who did all of those things? You know, not only Israel's ability to survive is predicated upon its memory, but I got news for you. The black community's uh, impetus to survive is predicated upon our own memory, our own memory of who brought us through. Our own memory of who brought us over. Our own memory that somebody who didn't have prayed for us somewhere along the way. Our own memory of the blood, sweat, and toil that somebody had to go through in order to just get to a one-room schoolhouse. We, we need to remember that, that, that somebody did not have it easy. Somebody had few choices but was determined that their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren were going to have more choices than they had. Somebody made a choice for your future. Somebody made a choice for your existence. Life's choices. The scripture is not very complicated. It basically simply says that when you go into that land, you better be determined to walk along with me. You better be determined to love me. You need to be determined in understanding who brought you through and who brought you over. You need to have your heart wide open. And you need to have your heart wide open as God's heart is open. One of the things that always is interesting to me is that folks are fearful of what they don't know about. 
And, and, and the catch-22 is that they're so fearful of the stuff that they don't, don't know about that they don't want to know about it. And so the fear even gets deeper. If you look at America, we may have defeated segregation by law, but segregation by economics still exists, right? That you got black neighborhoods and Latino neighborhoods and white neighborhoods, they exist. And people do not know who people are. And as a consequence, people are afraid of people. And, and, and if you look at it, and I'm not saying this to be racist or anything like that, but by and large, in the white community, the white community basically can stay among themselves. In the black or Latino community, we have to go into the white community and learn their language, their culture, their styles in order to survive, in order to be able to pay the mortgage when we come home. We got to generally go into a white world. And therefore, we know white folks, but white folks don't know black folks, and white folks don't know Latino folks. And, and out of that, there's this fear that has gripped the country, and it has been, in a sense, uh, proliferated uh, upon us, and we have basically, and I'm not talking about us, but largely the culture has bought into this fear. But see, in the midst of fear, there's another choice, and that choice is faith. We don't suppose to let... Fear, I was going to use the word trump our faith, but <laughs> we, 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 don't let, we don't let fear jack up our faith, amen? How's that? That's a better term, I think. Amen. I mean, the fact, the, the issue is, is we have faith because faith reminds us that when you can't, God is able. Faith reminds us that when the world says no and God says yes, it's yes. Of faith, it, it reminds us that there are choices that can be made even in the most dire of circumstances. Faith reminds us that we can overcome great odds. Faith reminds us that there's a victory in store. All we got to do is trust and believe and hold on to God. Faith reminds us that we can climb the higher ground no matter who is trying to pull us down. Faith reminds us that there is sanctuary in God even if the world around us is hostile. Faith reminds us that we can run on and do on because God has given us the power to believe on. I'm going to believe in the Lord and trust in the Lord and make my choices in and with God. There are choices in life, but I choose God. That's my invitation. Choose God and you'll choose to live. Choose God, and you choose life. Choose God, and we'll be able to stand up to the evil forces that are trying to assail us. Choose God, and there's no power under the sun will be able to defeat you. Choose God. And you'll be able to stand up day after day and moment after moment. Choose God. For God is a power that will take us from here to there. Folks may think that they have power, but I got news for you. Power sits high and looks low and holds it all in his hands. I choose God. So the choices in life is to choose God and to walk boldly along with our Lord. The doors of the church are open. I pray that somebody here today know what I'm talking about and know about this God of liberation and this God of power and empowerment. If that's you and you want to have a relationship with him, I invite you forth during the singing of our invitational. If you're looking for a church home and I invite you to become a part of this church, Plymouth Church, come forth during the singing of our invitational hymn. Number 511, if you can stand. If you want to join the church, come forward. You want to make a declaration of faith, come forward. The doors of the church are open. I cannot tell it all.
share of the spread of the town. Come and share at this table, because it's all been prepared for you. For we're reminded at this table about the choices that were made. Uh, Judas made a choice, a decision, which had its impact and killed Jesus. But thank God that God also has chosen. And there was that thing called the resurrection. Amen. Uh, amen. After all the bleak and destroyed, yes. it was God who stepped in and intervened yes. and changed the situation <coughs> and the circumstances. Yes. So we go with the decision, the choices of God. We stand with the choices of God. We'll have a prayer for the bread and a prayer for the cup of the Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for, for the choice, for the choice to come to your table of grace, to come not because we must, but to come because we may. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, Christ Jesus, and all that it represents in our lives. Now as we come to this table of grace, we ask that you will consecrate unto us this bread. It is the bread of blessing that you have intended to be, and that it represents the broken body of our Lord.
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Amen. Let us join together in the prayer that our Lord taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Our recessional hymn is Love Divine, All Love Excelling. If we can stand and join together on page 440 in the African Heritage uh, Hymnal, African American Heritage Hymnal, uh, and I will lift up our benediction to us today. Amen. Amen. Brother Middleton, it's good to see you today. Amen. And Jamal. It's wonderful to see you. Be blessed by you. Amen. Amen. And as we go forth from here, let us share the choices that God has made. And those choices that God has called us, has called us forward to do and to share the light. Allow the light and the joy of Christ be manifest wherever we find ourselves. Amen. Let us share it in a bold way. Let us share it in a way of love. And let us share it in the way of Jesus, our Christ. We pray this prayer in the name of the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen and amen.
trying to get out of here. Do me a favor. Yeah, I want Great job.